everybody join now. I love you, Lord, and I live my boy to worship you, oh my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet. Amen and welcome to North Carolina Baptist Church. Are you glad to be in God's house? Yeah. Are you, can you imagine any place else you'd want to be other than right here on Sunday morning? Nope. You can say no. Nope. Hey, Y'all do a lot better with the amen, so we'll practice that, okay? I'm glad to see you. Uh, for those of you who were able to make the Friday night and Saturday night uh, end times uh, prophecy thing, man, what a treat. Amen? That was awesome. Okay. Thank you. William's here. Ginger's here. Matthew's here. Uh, I will tell you this before I forget. Uh, if you need uh, the packet uh, that he went over, we have plenty. So I just tell you and, and all those that are watching uh, on the video today that if you will go to NorlinaBC at Yahoo.com and request it, we can email it straight to you. Or if you get a hold of the church, Ms. Deborah will mail it to you. It is the entire packet with everything he covered. Um, and we'll be glad for you to have it if you need it, so forth and so on. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, let's begin our worship this morning with a hymn, 406, which is the solid rock. Let's stand and sing. Let's hope you're on solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide its face, it rests on the unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. Solid rock, I said, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may this land him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Oh, Christ the Son. Just remain standing and let's praise the Lord with all praise his name. Roll that bean footage, Bubba. Crank it up real loud so all us old folks can hear. As my life to Calvary, for Jesus bled and died for I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior, that curse is free. His body bound. 
what a glorious day it'll be too when our eastern sky is coming back coming back It's prayer time, my friends. It's going on a Baptist church. It's time that we set aside every week to get our hearts and minds right before God. It's a special day. Well, we've got visitors here today, and we are just so glad you're here. I pray that you'll fill out a visitor's card if you didn't get one. If you let Brother Tony know he's in the back, he'll put one in your hand and just get it to me or to him or whatever. It's a good day to be in God's house. It's not a good day to be in Afghanistan. It's not a good day to be an American in Afghanistan. It's not a good day to be a Christian in an Ismi Muslim dominated society. We need to be praying mightily for that country, for the rights of those people, for the women, for the change. We need to be praying mightily for our leadership who's made the decision that has resulted in the unfolding as it did. I don't care what party you're in or anything else. I, look, I'm not about politics. Anybody knows me knows that. What I am about is right's right and wrong's wrong. Amen. <laughs> and right now, it would appear that leaders in Washington sure need an influx of God's influence in a mighty and powerful way. You need to be praying for our folks that are sick. There are folks out today. The good news is the presentation the last two nights went out live broadcast. So a lot of people who had COVID were at home were able to watch it. Uh, at one count, uh, Brother Matthew was sharing with me, there were 53 people had watched Friday night above and beyond the 28 or 29 that were here. And last night, I don't know what the latest count was. I heard 26, 20 something anyway. And there's about 20, 29 here. So. We reached people all over with that presentation, Brother William, and so we thank you mightily for coming and sharing with that, and we look forward to your next trip, uh, that you'll be able to do that. Matter of fact, we look forward to you moving back here, just letting you know. I have it on the authority of my boss that if we could find you a job around here, that you'd be back, see, so I'm just, uh, by the way, when you go to prayer time, pray for that, for God. Hey. Look, if you don't ask, you don't get, brothers and sisters. I'm telling the truth, okay? So uh, that's my heart's desire, and uh, I hope it's God's will. All right, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's go to the Lord. First thing out of your heart to God's ears is, God, forgive me. Lord, I am a sinner. I have not done right. You know I've not done right. I don't care what anybody else knows or doesn't know. The Lord knows. Get forgiveness from the Lord first thing so that you can hear his word and song and message. <clears throat> Pray for those people who are sick and in need of a healing touch by God. Pray for your spouse and family members. Some of the ones that I know about, Miss Lorraine needs prayer. Miss Karen needs prayer. She came to church, dropped her husband off, 
Well, actually, she slowed down and let him out. She went home not feeling well. She'll be in prayer for her. Be in prayer for Brother Stan Wumper. Be in prayer for Miss Hope. Be in prayer for the Bigler family. Be in prayer for this church, that God will continue to reconstitute this church um, at a level that would stagger the community with God's kingdom growth. If it be God's will, Lord, we just come to you. And if it be your will that the Westcott's find their home back here, that would bless our heart. But we, don't, we want what you want, Lord. We really do. And Lord, we submit our this whole church, it's your church anyway, we submit what we do to you and pray for your blessings, pray for your, your guidance, pray for a clear path, even when the world around is foggy. Father, I pray that you just make it clear to us which direction the decisions we have to make. I pray that we'll continue to be able to sing glorious songs to you, that we'll be able to praise your name, Lord uninhibited by anything. We lift up our arms and just worship you from our heart to your ears, Lord, from your heart to your heart, Lord, from my, from my body to you, Lord. Father, keep give us this complete freedom. Father, we lift up the people in Afghanistan. We don't even totally understand everything that's going on, but we know it is definitely messy. And the people are going to die. I hope, Lord, that through all that process, your name and your word can be seen and intervene in such a way that people will be drawn to you as a result of it. We pray for protection for our soldiers, for our brothers and sisters. Father, we pray for people we don't even know over there that need to know you. We just lift them up to you. Father, as we go through this worship service, may your word be unfolded. May I be removed and be used by you as a messenger to get it out in the hearts and minds of those here. We love you, Lord. We lift up this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. By God's grace, the choir is going to present a song that you're all familiar with. I'm sure you've all ever heard his eyes on the sparrow. What in the world does that mean anyway? In case you missed it, what it means is if God is such a God that he cares about that little old Tweety Bird, how much more do you think he cares about you, his great creation? The creation that he made that actually can tell him no. He didn't want you to tell him that. But he gave you that ability to think and to reason. He's done everything to draw you to him, but ultimately, it's your call.
I love hearing that choir. I don't know about you, but I just do. You know, by God's grace, if you are gifted with singing and you're not up there, well, let me just say it. Theologically as I know how, using the best English I can, shame on you. <laughs> you got the gift you need to be up there. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, there's a few other guilty ones I can see. All right, as the choir makes their way down and the young people, you may go to young people's church. Quietly, reverently. The rest of you take your copy of God's Holy Infallible and Errant Word and pull it out to the book of the Revelation and to the 14th chapter as we continue our studying and training and so forth into the tribulation. Nothing like good cold water. Oh, oh, oh. All right, everybody that's found their way to the Revelation and to chapter 14, beginning in verse 6, is where we're going to pick up tonight, this afternoon, today, this morning, whatever it is. Whew, I'm confused, but I stay confused. Amen and amen. Y'all notice a bunch of young folks coming to church? Isn't that awesome? Amen. Look, what y'all don't know is one of our young people was in the sound booth helping us, Samantha. Thank you, Matthew. Amen. Appreciate it, brother. And there's a knucklehead in the back. He ain't very big, but, but right now. Would you be, he turned around. He ain't but a year old and he must know what I was talking about him. Oh, my grandson. In church already. Praise Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let me start off with my normal weekly reminders that we are in the book of Revelation. This is talking about a time that has not occurred yet. If you were here the last two nights, you know we're getting close to it. But it has not happened yet. The John, while on the out of the Patmos, exiled there because of his Religious proclivities. You like that word, Elaine? That's a good name. He is on his island, and God has given him a vision that's being played out in real visionary time frame, not somebody reading him something, but he's seeing it. You also should know that the book of Revelation is not in necessary chronological order. Some things get bounced around. That's okay, too. But let me give you one more little warning. If you think you can read the Revelation, and that's all you got to do to understand it, I would highly suggest you spend a little time with me, or Miss Jean, or Brother William, somebody, and we'll, we'll help you out because I can tell you you can't do it. Yeah. I mean, you just cannot take that book and just read it and say, okay, I got nothing wrong. I've been at this a long time, and I'm still digging in it. But that's okay. It's not here yet, so i got time to learn it. Amen. Lastly, before we get going full speed here, why in the world are we talking about this stuff? As a matter of fact, if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you're not even going to be here. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Glory to I'm going to be in heaven. But guess what? Not everybody you know is saved. As a matter of fact, I dare say some of the people in your family aren't saved. Some of the people you work with aren't saved. Some of the people in your very household may not be saved. And they need to know what you're learning here as a way of saying, you don't want to be there. And if you listen to Brother William last night, he made it real clear. It can happen today. Okay, all the things necessary for the tribulation to start, God can cause to happen in a day. <laughs> Why? For he's God. He's God. You can't put him in a box. Shame on the people to try. All right. You know, it's the nature of people to constantly hope for a better day. Amen. Don't you want a better day? Amen. Look, when I do, I'm a, I want to preach. When I say amen, you're supposed to say amen, see? 
That's like throwing a T-bone steak to a dog, man. Come on, help me out here. If you don't believe that's true, then why is it that politicians promise to bring us better times if they're elected? I mean, that's how to get elected. They promised you they're going to do and come make your life better. And world leaders, they strive to find common ground between the nations so they can bring about a particular thing called peace and harmony. Everybody would like to see the stock market up, the crime rate down, poverty and disease eliminated, and the environment preserved. They would like to see an end to hatred and strife. Amen? Amen. We, we, want, we want all them things. Well, here's what you might not have thought about it. But mankind's efforts to bring about a better world, however well-intentioned we may be, is ultimately doomed. We think because we have the power and the knowledge within us that we can bring about a better environment, a better situation. Well, if that's true, where is it? <laughs> Our efforts... Unfortunately, I'm out in a little more than rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic so that people have a better view of the ship sinking. <laughs> Think about it. The truth is that ahead for mankind, coming on down the line, is not a better world for this day. It's an unimaginable worse day that lies ahead. In the future, God's going to pour out his wrath and judgment on a scale never seen before. Only after the earth is utterly devastated and the unbelievers judged, then a better day is going to come. And so I don't want you to leave here thinking, no, that preacher, he don't talk about doomsday. He thinks everybody's going out. No, look, I want you to know that there's coming a day. Lights at the tunnel. It's going to be awesome. You know what day that is? That's the day Jesus comes back. When he comes back to this earth after he's been through all that judgment and sets up his millennial kingdom, man, happy, happy, happy. <laughs> I want to be there. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be there. I got it on the authority of his word. I'm going to be in the millennial kingdom. I hope you are too. The blessed day of the earthly kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, in this text in 14, last week we talked about the 144,000 and, and standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. That's good, man. That's, that's good stuff. Of course, when did that take place? Well, at the end of tribulation. But now I want to talk about some angels. Y'all do know angels are around all the time, right? They are. They are. You don't really look like necessarily, but they can take different form, but they're around. So John starts off by saying, I saw another angel. Now, if you've got your handouts in the bulletin, this is where you want to start getting ready because here it comes, right? He said, uh, the angels, I, I thought before we get into those three angels, you need to know something about them angels. So I'm going to give you a little overview. First of all, angels play a major role in the end time events. They do. You see it as you go through Revelation. Okay, not only that, but they will gather the non-elect for judgment. All right, if anybody is part of the non-elect in here, please raise your hand. Anybody? Well, they all had some good teaching then. The non-elect are people that are lost, who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What does that term non-elect mean? Without getting into another sermon today, which I'm not going to do, the non-elect simply means that God knew before the beginning of time, that they would never come to the saving knowledge of his son. On the other hand, they gather the elect for glory. Raise your hand if you're in the elect. Come on. There you go. Good. Praise the Lord. All right. Even people back in the sound booth back there, they all raising their hands, shouting glory back there. That's good. Angels, uh, they accompany the Lord Jesus Christ as he returns to earth in great triumph. Can you imagine the day when the eastern sky all lights up and Jesus with the angels and all of them come on down just to get us out of here at the beginning of the tribulation? Now, he actually not going to come to earth, but he's going to be up in the sky. Woo, doggies. going to be a day now. Here's what you need to remember about that now, is when that day comes, the world's already going to be in a mess. 
It didn't like suddenly, boom, everything going to mess. Oh, no. As a matter of fact, if y'all had not noticed, the world's in a mess right now. I mean, there's wars all over the place. Uh, you know, you know, people are, 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 are ganging up against Israel right now. That's a sure sign this ain't going to be long, folks. As I shared with the crowd last night, I think, and I've shared with you before, you mark it down. The day America deserts Israel is done. We're done. As a nation, we're done. We're done. While some angels are used by God to bring judgment, the three angels that I'm going to tell you about today are not. They're not bringing judgment. What they are bringing is an astonishing proclamation from God concerning the consummation of the age. Okay? They're there to proclaim things, to let people know things. They do not appear in sequential or chronological order, as I stated earlier. What they do, though, is address issues and events that stretch around, you know, all over the tribulation period. So their message also anticipates the judgment of the seventh trumpet. We ain't had that yet. It's coming. Hang on. It also gives information to produce a remedial fear leading to saving faith. Come on, preacher. What in the world is remedial fear? I knew you were going to ask that. The Lord just told me they're going to ask that. They might not ask out loud, but they're asking in their mind. If your daddy, if you were fortunate enough to have a father in the raising process, and he told you to do something or not to do something, and you counteracted and did what he told you not to do, you probably paid some consequences. Amen? Well, the deal is, if you paid that consequences enough times, you had a, a reverential fear of your daddy, and so you didn't want to do that, because you knew there were consequences of reverential fear. Let me put it another way. I used to skydive. You know how airplanes? I did. Uh, I was younger. And uh, I used to scuba dive. I did. I was younger. Uh, I used to do a lot of them things that were called in today's world dangerous. You know what I'm talking about? At my age, I try to avoid the dangerous things. But here's the deal. I developed some years ago a remedial fear of doing those things. For instance, if you scuba dive and your air quits, you're in serious trouble. Amen? Amen? If you don't pay attention to your little device that tells you how much air you got, you're in trouble. Amen? Amen? So I have this remedial fear, meaning I know better than to do that. I'm afraid to go down 150 feet anymore at 71 years old, even with all the oxygen I can carry. Why? Because I'm going to get tired. I don't hang swim like I used to swim. I don't have the energy I used to have. And if you're anywhere near my age, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You might have wanted to do it, but it ain't happening, Jack. That's what this remedial fear is all about. They're trying, the angels are trying to get people to know, look, you need to understand God is God. You're not. Satan's not. And you really want to please God. That's where he's heading with all this thing. God will graciously offer these sinners another opportunity to repent before unleashing the terrifying bold judgments. And these three angels, one, first one's going to preach about eternal gospel. The second one's going to pronounce judgment. The third is going to promise damnation. So let's get to them. Here we go. The first angel preaching the gospel in verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having the eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation, and tribe, and tongue, and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and to worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. So this first angel. During the present age, my friends, that's the day that we're living Angels are not permitted or privileged to preach the gospel. 
said, did you know that? Why? Because we're supposed to be doing it. The responsibility falls on God's people. Now look, I don't know why God, in his infinite wisdom, chose a bunch of human beings like us to do something so important. But he did. He said, you people, my people, you go out and you win the loss, and you, and you bring them to Jesus, and then you raise them to spiritual maturity, and so they can go out and win the lost again. He chose us to do that. He commanded us to do that. He expects us to do it, not the angels. But when we get to this time frame, we're not going to be here, right? So the angels are listening out a proclamation. Also, the responsibility is given to God's people, but also... This section right here said that angels flying around in mid heaven. I don't know how many of y'all studied enough to find out mid heaven is. We touched on mid heaven somewhere in one of these other chapters, and I kind of flew right by it. But this time, I thought you would like to know before you went to lunch today what mid heaven is. So here it comes. I got it spelled out for you. All right. It is the point in the sky where the sun reaches its meridian apex or the high point at noon. That is what mid heaven is. Well, you might know you'd like this. See. Take a note. And somebody asks you what midheaven is, now you know. But there's a reason for it. It's not just the place. It is, in fact, from that point that the angel can be most visible to all those on the earth. From that point, the angel could also be beyond the reach of the Antichrist as well as Satan and his demon host. You remember, this angel is going out there proclaiming, okay? And what is he proclaiming? While the nations will fear the beast to give honor to him, this heavenly messenger is going to summon these nations, summon them, telling them to fear and honor God and God alone. One of the things that we learned in a lot of Baptist church since I've been here many years ago, God is God in what? God is God in? Don't forget that. I mean, that's the first thing you all say every day. You get a God is God and I'm not. Okay, it'll help you through the day. It'll keep you humble. Okay? Because a lot of times, see, we're so gifted and smart and have man, sometimes we think we're smarter than God. Let me tell you something. I studied real hard the last 20 years I've been doing this pastor, and God has yet, not yet, ever called and asked me my opinion about anything. And you know something? I'm going to go to my grave, and he probably never will, okay? All right. To not only fear of God alone, but to remind them that God is the creator. God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? There was nothing before God created it out of nothing by simply saying that it be. What has Satan created? Nothing. <laughs> and that's what his angel is going to be trying to tell him. He's also trying to instill that God alone deserves the worship. In verse 6 right there, I'm talking about eternal gospel. John was given the vision of this angel carrying a message called the eternal gospel. I need to, he's, he's commissioned to bring this message to every group of people on the earth, all the nations. But here's the rub. Some people, theologians or whatever, read this and they say, well, that's not the good news that we know. Now, hold on, because I need you to know there's more than one description of the gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Good news, right? You with me? So I took a little liberty here on a little side excursion for this morning so that you would see that uh, when you look at Scripture, that this good news, the gospel, in various in various terms, each looking at it from a different point of view. First of all, and in your handout you should have this, so just write it in. The gospel is called the gospel of the kingdom. It's in Matthew. The gospel is also called the gospel of Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 1. I'm not done yet. The gospel is called the gospel of God in Mark 1.14. And every time you use that word gospel of, you can say good news of. 
The gospel is called the gospel of grace in the book of Acts. It's called the gospel is called the gospel of glory of Christ in 2 Corinthians. The gospel is called the gospel of peace, that peace that passes all understanding in Ephesians 6. The gospel is also called the glorious gospel in 1 Timothy 1.11. glorious gospel. All right. Give me an amen if you got all those down. You got them? You can go back and read them later, but you got them. Uh, there's a reason why I'm doing this, because I, as I was studying this stuff, it just came up. Some of these people said, well, that can't be a gospel of saving grace, and I'm going to tell you something. It is. <laughs> all right? And uh, I want you to understand that here's, here in, in the gospel is described as eternal because it provides the means to eternal life. What this angel is, remember we've got three angels. This is the first one. He's proclaiming God to be God, and we're not. He's proclaiming the good news. He's proclaiming to people that this good news, that God's going to forgive all their sins and those who, if those who repent and those who believe in the Lord Jesus as the only way to salvation. He is doing that. He's proclaiming it. It's as if there's one last chance. One more opportunity. And folks, if you study this at all, you know that some people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ during the tribulation. The angel announced, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. By the time... The angel begins his ministry. The world will have suffered incredible devastation of the seal and trumpet judgments. And all that, friends, there will be relentless holocaust that have rocketed the whole globe. Like something that we can't even conceive sitting here in a nice padded pews and air conditioned, even in better shape as America is. During this time, the unbelieving world will have already heard the gospel preached by the 144,000 evangelists. It had already heard the gospel unfolded by the two witnesses. It will already have heard the gospel by the countless thousands of others saved under, the, under their ministries. These people come to know Jesus Christ even under the duress of, the, of what's going on. And so they'll be telling other people about it as well. But here comes the heartbreak. In spite of all those people, the suffering, the devastation, the preaching, most of the earth's population is going to reject the gospel. Man, that bring tears to your eyes. It should bring tears to the eyes of everyone in this room who is a true believer that there will be people out there who have heard the gospel who are going to reject it anyway. Even so, my friends, God graciously sends his powerful angel who's proclaiming the gospel to him one more time. The, game, the angels announce and fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. But you know something? Jesus had said, he had declared back when he was on earth, that before the end comes, the whole world will hear the gospel of the kingdom. You remember reading that in Scripture? Before the end comes, everybody will have heard the gospel. This angel that I'm telling you about, He's going to reach any who still have not heard the gospel. This is their, kind of like their last run. Here he comes. You've heard the preaching. You've heard the teaching. Now you've seen this angel at this mid-heaven level tell them, but here's the deal, folks. Bottom line, God's judgment is coming. It's here. It's on us. All right. 
Let's talk about the second angel. The second angel. All and fallen, Babylon the great. In verse 8, and another angel, the second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. The repetition there underscores the finality, the certainty, and the comprehensive nature of this judgment. One thing you need to get in your notes, in your head, Babylon is not about the city of Babylon. It's about um, the Antichrist worldwide political, economic, and religious empire. It's the metaphor for, for Satan's Antichrist domain, as it were. Babylon has, by the way, from inception, symbolized evil and rebellion against God. But this angel's proclamation will come as a, here it comes, shock to the unbelieving world. You see, because they've been sold such a bill of goods by the Antichrist as he's built up his power and he's built up his world control, they're not going to believe that this can happen, that this, the Antichrist's mighty empire, if you will, the Antichrist's most powerful empire in all the history, that that empire would be destroyed, would be inconceivable to his followers. They will be so sold out and so convinced of the power of the satanic control that they are, the angels tell them, look, this second angel, Babylon's fallen, Bubba. Babylon's going to be destroyed. They're not buying into it. That's angel number two. First angel, got one more chance. Second angel, hey, the empire of Satan is going to be gone, going to be destroyed. By the way, a little side note. This proclamation of this angel, he's is anticipating, if you will, the events in Revelation 18. We're going to get there in more detail. Not today. The third angel. You could say that this third angel is issuing a dire warning. Look at verse 9 and following. <clears throat> and another angel, a third one, <coughs> followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast in his image <coughs> and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And goodness gracious, that's spooky. This third angel delivers the one with a loud voice so that the people will hear and understand his message. Loud, they're not necessarily just loud, loud, but loud meaning loud and clear. He's speaking in no uncertain terms. It's like a choir when they sing together and they enunciate clearly. The words come out. You know, the worst thing I can't ever understand I, since I've been a teenager, and me y'all ever been into music, you know, we went through a series in our music culture that people would sing songs. You couldn't understand the words. Amen. Look, folks, if you can't understand the words of a song, what good is a song? I'm sorry. It ain't just my old ears. You know, it's just they... Anyway, this, this here loud, this loud, this angel speaking loud, but to make sure they understand the message. So they will comprehend that God is perfectly holy and righteous. God is perfectly holy and righteous. So they will know that God judges people because they reject what they know to be true. And fourthly, so they'll understand why everyone sentenced to hell will be without excuse. Hold your finger right there. I need you to flip back to the book of Romans just for a moment into the first chapter of the book of Romans. And if you don't have this earmarked in your Bible, I highly recommend you do. This first chapter of the book of Romans is mind-boggling. But let me just sum it up. With verse 20 and verse 1 of chapter 2. Verse 20, are you there? Give me amen. amen. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, 
being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Stop the trucks. God's word says everybody knows that God is God by just looking out there and see. How many of y'all can make a tree? Anybody y'all, anybody in here know how to make air? If you don't believe God's out here, quit breathing. Just hold your breath. You be hollering for God. Anybody ever see air? No. Do you need it? Yeah. I'm going to tell you something else. Anybody that buys into evolution is going in contradiction to God's word. And I just gave you the verse that said God created it, folks. I mean, there it is. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore you are without excuse, every man of you who passes judgment, for in you judge, in that you judge one another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge crap practice the same things. Why would people be sentenced to hell? And let me just say to you, God doesn't send anybody to hell. People choose to go. Okay? Nobody has to go. All you got to do is accept Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, and you got a one-way ticket away from that place. But if you choose to reject God's offering, you're going. And you can't say, I didn't know, because it says right there, God created it so that you would know. Flip back over to Revelation. But the warning is being addressed to anyone who worships the beast. Who worships his image. Who receives the mark on his forehead or his, and you can write in your notes, right hand. You know, I had a question, I think it was last week, whenever I was, why the right hand? And nobody came up to me with an answer because I didn't know either. I was always curious. Why the right hand? I think because the right hand in most places is the dominant hand. So if the right hand or the forehead, if you can't hide if it's on your forehead, and if it's on your dominant hand, you know, maybe that's the reason. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say specifically. I'm just throwing that in there for you. You know, it will seem that the deceived followers of Antichrist will receive that mark that they are backing the winning side. They think they are. But the angel's trying to warn them that the terrible fate awaits those who, despite all of God's judgments and warnings, persist in worshiping Antichrist. Once again, God's graciously calls on sinners to repent even in that final hour. In verse 10, we just read those who drink of the wine of the harlot, Babylon, will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now, you've got to understand what we're talking about here. This is metaphorical language. But basically it says, look, if you choose to involve yourself with Antichrist, doing Antichrist things, then you are going to subject yourself also to the wrath of God. If you go down this path, you are going down this path. You understand? Everybody get that? Give me an amen. amen. I mean, let me tell you something. It's not only true revelation. It's true today, too. You choose the world. You got the wrath of God. That's your choice. Then all choices in life have consequences. Some good, some not so good. But you are accountable to God in the end. And so what he's saying to you here is the wrath of God is mixed in full strength, is what the scripture says, in the cup of his anger. And that the, the full fury of God's wrath has been so long restrained because of this patient love in God, but it's going to be unleashed. Let me remind you again, it's not being unleashed against his children. They're not there. <laughs> They're gone. This is people who have rejected God through the generations, who have been time and time again, they've seen these bad things happen. They've had people tell them, you need to turn to God, you need to turn to God, you need to turn to God, but they're still turning to Satan. So I ask you, because I've been asked this many times, how can a God of love actually permit his creatures to suffer eternal judgment? If you've been in ministry, of any kind of ministry, or any witnessing, if you've gone out, sooner or later somebody's asked you this question. I need you to be able to answer it. You need to be able to answer it. 
And it's not a flippant question. This is a real, for some people, it's a real legitimate question in their heart and mind. If God is a God of love, and he is, how could he allow or permit to suffer like these people are going to suffer? And I'm sure many of you have had the answer, and I'm going to do my very best to answer it. In a way, you can get your arms around it. Here's what you need to know. God's love is a holy love. It's a perfect love. It's not based on sentimentality. Sentimentality or sentiments or feelings or anything like that are wishy-washy. God's love is a perfect love. He created you. He gave you the ability to love him. He asked that you love him. But if you, even if you, you're nasty, which we all are, and we all sin, God still loves us as only he can. He loves you that much. God's love, therefore, it must be justly dealt with sin. What kind of love would God have if he didn't have any kind of standard? He has a standard. It's called sin. You know, here's where God's goal, here's where we're supposed to be, and when you shoot outside the mark, you miss the mark, you sin. Forgiveness brings you back in line with the mark. But because you sin, you create a separation, a wall between you and God. And the only way to get back in line with God is to repent. God, I admit I messed up. Please forgive me. All right, you're forgiven. It puts you back in line. It gets you back in where you need to be with him. But if he didn't do that, if there were no consequences, if there was no, if there was no um, price to pay, for, for sin, what kind of love would that be? God's love repeatedly warns sinners. Don't do that. He not only warns us ahead of time. Don't do that. You don't want to do that. Look what happened every time the Jewish nation turns back on God's way. God said, this is what you need to do. If you go do this, everything will be all fine. Look up here for a second. When God sent the nation of Israel across the Jordan River, he said, here's what I want you to do. I have given you all this land. Amen. Anybody ever studied history? You know God gave it to them. All, right. all they had to do was go take it. God gave it to them. Now go take it. They said, well, some of them guys are big and strong. Look, I gave you the land. You get out there, you take it. Okay? What did they not do? They didn't take it. Guess what? The very enemies of Israel today are sitting on some of the land that God gave them that they didn't go take. Does he not love them? Oh, no, he loves them. But they didn't do what he told them to do. So they drank of the wine of Babylon. And so now they're taking the wine, the wrath of God. God's love repeatedly warns sinners. And number four, God's love has given them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. If you've ever come to North Carolina Baptist Church more than one time, every time you're here, you know this preacher, this church has offered you the opportunity to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. That's what we do. Why? Because God said do it. It's the right thing to do. It's the theological thing to do. And besides... I'm one of them guys that wants to go to heaven with everybody. I want us all to go up there. Amen? Black, white, green, yellow, otherwise, let's all go up there. Amen. But one thing I've learned for 20 years, a bunch of people keep rejecting, keep saying no. I'm going I'm to get there, Doug. I'm going to get there, preacher. But not right now. God's wrath. You need to understand that God's wrath is not an impulsive outburst of divine emotion aimed at some people whimsically. There's nothing impulsive about what God does. Why? Because God knows everything. <laughs> He's omniscient. Write it down. He not only knows everything, brothers and sisters, He knows all the possibilities of everything because He's God. God's wrath is not, it is the 
listen to me, this is going to sound harsh, but you got to put it in context. It is settled, deliberate, merciless, graceless response of a righteous God against all unrepentant sinners. In other words, if you are an unrepentant sinner, there is no hope that you're going to escape this except to give your heart to Jesus. That's the only way out of it. It's coming. <clears throat> God's eschatological wrath will be undiluted vengeance without any trace of compassion. If you are sitting there and you're hearing what I'm telling you and it bothers you, get over it. Because this is not Brother Doug making this stuff up. This is God. You hear me? This is what he's going to do, and he's justified in doing it, if for no other reason than he's God. But it's not like you haven't been told. It's not like you haven't been given an opportunity. It's not like he hasn't opened the door and said, hey, come to me, man. I'll, I'll take care of you. What horrifying fate awaits the person who drinks the wine of the wrath of God? Well, just in case you didn't hit it in your arms and legs yet, I'm going to give you some more details. Here it comes, tormented with fire and brimstone. Look, I'm not trying to paint a picture of doom. I'm trying to give you remedial fear. Did you get that? This is what awaits for those who stick around. Tormented. The verb, by the way, and you might, might just note in your Bible, uh, translated to be tormented, speaks of a ceaseless infliction of unbearable pain, but you'll never be consumed by it. How many of you ever burnt your finger? Or burnt it takes a long time to heal, doesn't it? Man, it's sensitive to water, to everything. You just, well, can you imagine having that feeling when you get a burn that never quits? For all eternity, you are feeling the pain of the fire. That's what it's describing. Of course, for those of you who may or may not be aware, the worst torment you're going to have if you wind up in hell is separation from God. And there is no chance of regrouping it. It's a done deal. His righteous anger will know no lessening. It will know no diminishing of their torment. They will have no moments of rest throughout eternity. How many of you get tired working physically? Don't you? Brother William will tell you, I got tired a lot yesterday. I had to sit down. I just praised God for his son because his son picked up slack. You know, his boy can pick up a 12-foot board with one hand. That amazed me. Until I remember, there was a time when I might do that, Sam. But them days are gone, Jack. Amen. I'm looking for William to get on the other end of the board when I'm moving it. No lessening, no diminish, no moments of rest. Well, when you're tired and you want to sit down, I can tell you, just sitting down for three minutes. Whew. And that bright brother Randy on that cement all day, he'd be looking for that chair at his office. Oh, yeah. And look, five minutes does wonders, doesn't it? It does. You can be amazed what five minutes can do. And when you reach my age and you eat lunch and you sit down and your eyes close for 15 minutes, you're not really napping, just 15 minutes. <laughs> you're ready to go back to work. But here's the deal. If you want them people that don't know Jesus and you're going to hell, you ain't not going to get no rest. You're going to be in pain 24-7, 365 for all eternity. And I almost slapped the pulpit, but I've been warned against it. <laughs> the people with the mirror back there, when I do that. Hell, the final resting place of the unregenerate. Unregenerate is described as the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. Whew, my goodness. Let's look at verse 11.
Verse 11, the final sobering thought about the punishment of those who worship the beast. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. I don't want to take the mark. I ain't going to take the mark. I just soon they go ahead and take me on out, folks. Just the way it is. Let me finish up putting icing on this. The first angel invited sinners to turn to God. Amen. Isn't that what it did? The second angel warned that, hey, all that Babylon, that whole system of Satan is going to be destroyed. Amen. And then the third angel come along and said this. Y'all didn't believe my first buddy that came. You ain't listened to the second buddy that came. So here is your dire warning that if you persist in your sins, even that God sends these judgments and warnings, then they only themselves to blame. Did you get that? Well, folks, God's been sending out angels for 2,000 years. He's been sending out messengers for 2,000 years. He's been sending out warnings for 2,000 years. And yet today, people still reject the truth. There are still people going to churches where there are preachers in the pulpit preaching heresy. Why do they sit under that kind of preaching? Well, preacher, I'd come to your church, but you scare me. Really? Really? Well, yeah, man, you're talking about hell and doomsday and all this kind of stuff. Let me quell your couple of rumors. I'm building a house with my family out on Owen Road. It ain't a church. I heard that rumor this past week. Yeah, they say you're out there building a church. Really? Come on, man. And the other rumor, that preacher at North Carolina Baptist Church, well, he's a, an extremist. Well, let me tell you what I'm extreme for, the love of God Amen. and hell's hot. Amen. Okay? And if you can't stand them two right there, you're right. You don't belong here. But that's what I'm going to try to teach you every week because I love you. I love you. I wish I could love you like God loves you, but I can't, but I try. But I want you to know the truth. And if sometimes you get offended by the truth, you know what? Here's the deal. If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ and you get offended by the truth, then you're probably not saved. If you get concerned, man, if it tweaks your conscience that I, I need to do better, then you're probably saved. Because we all need to be reminded. Yes, we do. These warnings are happening even today, and they're being ignored. But i got to tell you, folks, it's better to reign with Christ forever than the Antichrist for a few short years. And that's a choice you get to make every day. Every day we get to make a choice which path I'm going to go down. When I was raising my kids, I used to tell them about the fork in the road. Matter of fact, I sent out a little Facebook thing. I saw somebody had a picture of a fork in the road. Y'all didn't see that. But I raised my kids. I, I said, There's, life's a bunch of fork in the road, and you choose which path you're going. And depending on which path you go, there's consequences. Some good, some not so good. Some downright bad. But you can't go back to the fork, folks. You got to live with those consequences and make the best. Get back right with God. You choose to drink the wine of Satan, you will drink the wine of the wrath of God. Better to endure persecution patiently today, my friends, now and to escape it than to suffer throughout eternity. Let me close with this. Some of folks, they say, well, you know, I'm not going to be here, so I ain't going to worry about it. Really? What kind of Christian are you not to worry about the people who need to know? Secondly, while, while the stuff I'm teaching you here is going to happen during tribulation, it's already happening now. People are making choices, consequences. For young people, you make a, you make a decision in a moment of passion for one evening, and it will affect you the rest of your life. It will affect you the rest of your life. You have to live with that sentimentality, that feeling, that emotion. Folks, be wise. Make wise decisions. Be sure when wherever you're going to church, you're going to hear the word preached and taught unashamedly, unabashedly, 
every week so that you can grow in knowledge, grow closer to the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Almighty Holy God, we come to you today. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming, Lord. But it's not overwhelming for you. I pray, Lord, as we bring this time of learning to a close, that if there's anybody there, anybody here, who's not made that proclamation of faith, they go go ahead and do it today. <clears throat> they won't be worried about who's watching, who's listening, or anything else. They just go ahead and step out and say, I want to be a child of God. And Lord, may we bring them into the fold in a way that grows them to spiritual maturity and a close relationship with you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.